Welcome everybody to the Cleveland Salesforce Developer Group. Um, we're here today to talk about multi-factor authentication. This is our security check. And we're asking you the question, are you ready for MFA coming this February? We have to answer straight away. Sorry. That would help. <laughs> All right, now we're in the right mode. All right, so our uh, agenda today, we're gonna have a little bit of welcome and intros. We're gonna have a moment to share any achievements we've created or made this uh, last quarter. Then we'll get into our topic and we'll end with announcements um, as well as upcoming local events. So um, I'm Linda Kane, I'm one of the co-leaders. I'm currently the Senior Salesforce Developer at Travel Centers of America. I'm um, Orlando Briseño. I'm uh, one of the co-leaders of, of the groups. I'm currently uh, the Salesforce Architect at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is like a fancy title for, I don't know, like, uh, <laughs> like a super admin or something. So we wanted to open up the floor and you can put this in chat if you prefer and don't want to unmute, but if you've earned a certification in the last several months, um, started a new job, if you're new to the group, anything else you want to share, this is your chance to kind of add yourself. I'll share that I passed sharing invisibility in December, um, which also earned me my um, application architect certification. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh that there's a root blushy waiting for you, Linda. And um, I know, uh, Laura, uh, you, you also got the uh, architect, uh, application architect certification recently, right? Yes, sorry, I just came back to my computer. I had to take care of a kid. <laughs> so, that, that's totally if you're gonna have meetings on Saturday as the kids are around. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I got, um, in November, I got the uh security and visibility they just changed the name of it too sharing <laughs> the sharing invisibility architect um uh, certification and that finished off application architect for me and then in january i did a super badge on on january 1st because i was like i i'm gonna linda challenged me with the hundred days of trailhead or learning or whatever and i'm like well i'm gonna i'm gonna start big then <laughs> go super batch in january <laughs> well great start which uh super batch was that laura um the uh business administration one awesome any anybody else with a new certification a new super batch or yeah so, um hi everyone yeah uh, so i also did uh, uh, the sharing and visibility architect certification two days back um and uh, did a lwc uh, super batch also last november oh that's yeah. awesome yeah. that's Hey, hello everyone. I guess I can go next. I um I wasn't here for the the summer months, um, but I I started. I jumped into the consulting world, um, so that's that's been very interesting and fun. And the super badge, um, I did the integration super badge because I'm studying for the the architecture integration exam. Um, so. Yeah, keep him busy. <laughs> awesome. Congrats. And then I see Thanks. that player has a B two B solution architect. That's so interesting. You you you'll have to tell us how how's that one about. All right. So let's, uh, congratulations to everyone who's passed certs, who started new jobs. We're gonna get into our topic for the day. So um, in case you 
have been living under a rock or something. Um, in 2021, in February, they announced um, that officially they were going to require MFA. They said beginning February 1st, for those who know the release that's coming out, the winter release comes out early February, and that's pretty much when it's going to start. MFA is going to require supplying two or more pieces of evidence when logging in, primarily something you know, your username and password, and something you have, your authenticator app or security key. Um, a lot of this is around threats to security systems on, being on a rise globally and also constantly evolving. MFA is one way to enhance that login security. This is being required on all Salesforce products. So Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, Experience Cloud, Marketing Cloud, Prada, Mulesoft, you use it and it's from Salesforce, you're gonna have to do this. Um, it's, you can either offer MFA directly within the Salesforce products, or you can use SSO with your Salesforce products. Um, but that, if you're using SSO with your Salesforce products, that SSO should provide some form of MFA as well. So, um, kind of what's the security threat landscape looking like? Um, many organizations are still password enabled. So as of March 2020, 70% of all organizations still relied on password-centric authentications. Um, that came from a survey. I'm trying to remember which organization did it. I almost want to say Google. Um, noting 81% of all breaches are because of stolen or weak passwords. And according to Google, even SMS messages, text messages, which is one of the weakest forms of a two-factor authentication, can stop almost all automated attacks most of bulk phishing attacks and a large number of targeted attacks. Um, while SMS, even though it's weak, isn't going away, web often kind of became the official from the W3C um, in 2019. So I've got here the link to the web often guide and I will share out slides when this is over. It's part of the 502 framework. It is currently adopted by all major web browsers and mobile devices. It includes things like um, authenticator apps, security keys, and some in computer services, so like Windows Hello um, and Touch ID. I uh, kind of took the, the, the opportunity to share this uh, geeky comic strip uh, from XKCD. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys uh, know it, probably a lot of you do. So th this one in particular, it's it's about entropy and how um, complicated, hard to remember for humans passwords like like the first it, the first one, Trubal or ampersand tree with lower and uppercase and, and and all that. Those are easy to crack for computers, but really hard for humans to remember. And on the contrary, like um, long human readable, easy to remember uh, phrases like correct horse battery staple. Those are easily for humans to remember and hard for um, computers to crack. Uh, in, in a few more slides, uh, Linda's gonna share a link for to check how hard uh, a password is to break. You, you, maybe for fun, you can try a few ones and, and see how hard it will be for a computer to crack. Um, in, in another note, in um, the organization I work on, we use one password for uh, to store passwords, of course, and um, the master password to get in there, it actually, they, they recommend you to use uh, a very long uh, different words, no, no, no signs and symbols for, for the master password. So that's it, that's, that's why the comic it, it made, made it to the slides. Oh, really, how bad can passwords be? Well, according to NordPass, the 10 most common, aka worst, passwords of 2021 were mostly series of numbers. You will see from this list, but also included QWERTY and password. Um, also popularly used in passwords, people love to use their own names. Uh, band names, so One Direction and Metallica were two of the most popular band names to include in passwords. Uh, sport teams are popular, so Liverpool, Obviously uh, not an American sport team, but in the list, I also saw the sun, the heat. Um, Ferrari and Porsche are popular car brands that make it into four passwords. Dolphin is the number one animal used in passwords. 
Um, and another interesting side note, um, men like to use swear words and passwords, but women tend to use things like, I love you. So some basic password hygiene, longer is better. Typically right now, 12 is the character minimum that's recommended. I've actually heard 15 from my internal security where I work, but definitely using a mix. Um, and often better is to use a password generator. So if you can, um, don't reuse or use the same password for multiple accounts. Change your passwords at least every 90 days. Uh, regularly assess your password health. So these three links are links to different um, tools that assess um, how strong the passwords are. I wouldn't say they're perfect, but they give you an idea. And um, the other recommendation is to use a password manager like LastPass, Keypass, Keeper, any of those that are listed. Um, to help you so that, you know, especially if you use a generator, it's kind of hard to remember those. So the MFA requirement, I know this comes up a lot, which environments is it required in? Where do we have to do it? So um, production environments, definitely. Um, sandboxes or maybe, they recommend it. Um, I don't know about your org, I know where I'm at. We have to do it if we have data in the sandbox. So any partial or full sandboxes, we have to have some form of MFA turned on. It is being required for B2C Commerce Cloud sandboxes. That's the only one where it is required for a sandbox outright. Um, it is not required for scratch orgs or trailhead playgrounds. And developer orgs are not outright required, requiring it. So it's considered a maybe, but it's highly recommended especially if that's the developer org where your um, credentials are linked to for Trailhead. Um, experienced cloud users are not required. So these are non-internal licenses to Salesforce. It'd be kind of tough for us to get everyone educated in the whole world who logs on to the various uh, community sites that are out there. Um, and then is it required for marketing cloud? Yes, it is required for marketing cloud, Roger. Um, Sorry, but it is. Um, so MFA options, uh, Salesforce Authenticator, um, obviously uh, a TOTP, so an authenticator that provides a one-time code that constantly generates new ones like Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, Duo, there are several others out there in the market. Uh, security key like YubiKey, um, there is uh, built-in authenticators like Windows Hello and Touch ID for Salesforce. Those are currently in beta. And then of course, SSO provided MFA. Um, and just again, noting if your SSO doesn't use MFA, you are supposed to use the Salesforce provided. So some other things to know, um, users can have multiple MFA methods. However, if you're on platform, you only get one TOTP. So you can have Microsoft Authenticator and uh, Salesforce Authenticator, but you cannot have both Microsoft Authenticator and Google Authenticator currently. Um, if you're using SSO, enabling delegated authentication so that you can see the is single sign-on and enabled system permission and assign that to profiles or permission sets, prevent users from logging in uh, with username and password. Um, that particular permission cannot be given to these existing standard um, profiles. So you either have to do it through a permission set or use it on custom profiles. Um, you can assign MFA to users via the profile or permission set. There is a system permission. It's multi-factor authentication for user interface logins. There are two that are similar. The other one's for APIs. Um, and um, if you're trying to use a security key, there is a known issue. So Google is updating to, of course, the latest and greatest version of um, authentication and APIs. And unfortunately, the Salesforce screens are still using a slightly older version. So right now, if you try, you get a message saying it's not going to be, it's not going to work as of February. Um, you can actually, according to the known issue, you can click the allow button, make sure then you click back into the Salesforce screen before you try to use your security key, and it may work. Um, they are right now applying for an exception for Google and working on updating the APIs and the scripting behind it. So um, follow that known issue 
if it's a problem for you. I can tell you right now, I'm on that known issue waiting for it to get corrected for myself. All right. Um, this is a suggestion, uh, uh, a pro tip, if you will, for you to easily manage all your users and, and their usage of MFA. You can create a, a list view within the, the, um, the users screen and, and add these fields to see who, uh, who's using Salesforce Authenticator, who has, a, has set up a time-based one-time password app or a U2F a security key. And um, if they have verified their email, their phone, and the last one, it's not a field per se, but it's, it's a link for you to generate a, a temporary code for, for them. And right there where, where um, it says uh, if they have, enable Salesforce Authenticator or the time-based one-time password, uh, you can unsubscribe uh, users from there. So it's it's a really central nifty way for you to, to manage or all of your org access. And there's a link for, for you to follow the steps and, and create that, that view. And this is an, another, um, way to have a, a, a view of all the access that's going to your org. It's it's a, an app exchange package. I, I don't remember. It, I think it might be from Salesforce Labs, uh, but, it, but it's a Salesforce uh, package. And, and it's a, lit, a dashboard with some widgets about where people are uh, logging in from, what mechanism are, are they using, and, and, and so on. Um, Linda, if, if you please go to the next slide. This is uh, these are some screenshots of, of the dashboards. At the time I took the screenshots, I was very early on on, on the MFA path. So uh, that gauge um, widget, it, it's on zero. It's like how um, how many of your users are using MFA, and but yeah, it tells you from which which cities are they logging in and, and if they're using passwords or if they are getting a um, challenge text me message or email, that, that, that sort of thing. That's something else to consider for, for you to check how your users are, are accessing your org. And um, just included th this one, um, um, I think this is going to be really helpful if you don't know where to start, or even if you do and, and want um, to prepare your users, tell them what's MFA and um, how to how to do it, and, and you want a, a, a starting point for you to send a, a communication. Uh, this MFA role pack, uh, it's offered by Salesforce. It's in several languages. I um, included that screenshot of, of the included files for, for, the, for English. Uh, and there are slides, there are, um, uh, there's a spreadsheet with testing plans and um, things to do for, for you to be organized and, and, and plan your, your MFA rollout. I, I think it's re really handy. So we thought we'd share our own adventures with MFA to give you some background on how we kind of approach this topic. So um, at the company I work for, we are on sales cloud and marketing cloud. So for sales cloud, for most users, they're doing SSO. We're actually doing Azure SSO and it has MFA enabled. Um, we're actually in midstream of pushing it out um, right now. So I pushed out our Azure SSO. We actually had um, a different service that we were using for SSO previously and are standardizing across the company. So. Um, that move was made this past week and users are getting used to having to log in from the My Domain site. Um, we're monitoring, we've sent them emails with um, kind of one or two page instruction sheets to help them get through that process of registering and making sure they're going to the right website um, for their login so that they're not going to login.salesforce.com anymore. They're going to um, our domain.my.salesforce.com. So those instructions included things like how to update bookmarks easily. Um, 
I can tell you the feedback so far has been positive. They like not having to type in their username and password all the time. SSO really handles that well. However, for our admin users, we are um, enabling MFA so, because we can't do de force delegated authentication on admin users. So for myself, I have to log in with MFA all the time. Um, and I have yet to uh, have both turned on at the same time. So we're gonna see what happens with that. That's coming next week, as well as the limiting people to not be able to log in from login.salesforce.com if they're not an admin user. Um, our, for our, our sandboxes, so our production, our full and our partial environments, we have uh, SSO turned on. So even our outside vendors um, have to log in through our Azure. Uh, there's a question. If you yeah. enable require MFA in production, does that automatically automatic? flow down? No, it does. It, if it's tagged on the profiles, it does flow down, but it is not actually required on the sandboxes. So usually you have to enable it again separately. So our developer and developer pro sandboxes were requiring Salesforce MFA. Um, basically, I generate the sandbox. And then when I go to that sandbox, I have to reassign the permission set to the users who are going to log in to that sandbox. Um, the other thing, interesting thing to note, when you have a user verify their login for a sandbox, the first time it does not request their MFA. So they actually have to do a second login to get the MFA set up for that sandbox environment. And then for our marketing cloud environment, we just enabled MFA. For the rollout of that, we, um, myself and the internal marketing person who serves as their admin for that tool, we shot a video of us actually getting our MFA working. We shared that video with the users along with step-by-step -step directions um, to take them through it. And it's a much smaller group for us. We only have about 11 users in Marketing Cloud. So getting them set up was pretty easy. Um, we are though still looking at doing SSO on Marketing Cloud in the future. We're just not quite ready for it. Uh, for myself, I work in a, in a nonprofit and we have a small user base. We have less than 30 users. Uh, so in a way I, ha I, ha I have it easy, but still I I'm a little behind in, in the MFA process. We don't have single sign on. That's that's just something else. Um, I started started rolling out MFA for, for a few for a few users. Everything's going well. Uh, we're gonna do it for for sales sales clouds in production and, and full for full. I'm thinking uh, just adding the permission set for the whole user base. There, there's not a lot of or users that that go to uh, or full environment except or or developers. And um, for production. I'll use the, the rollout pack to, to send communications, uh, get people um, notice for them to start preparing. I have already set up a, a few people in, in, in production and, and everything has gone well. We do have marketing cloud and MFA was already enabled there. So a third or even a half of our user base already have Salesforce Authenticator going. So I, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be easy, but uh, yeah, communications are, shows uh, start going out soon. And we do have a couple of consulting uh, companies and I'll, I'll ask them to, to, to enable MFA. I, I don't know, maybe not Salesforce Authenticator, but some other uh, time-based one password generators. And for my developer orgs, I have those a little abandoned. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I regret that, but uh, yeah, I, I should give them a little care and, and enable that as well. Yeah, so my personal developer orgs, I've been working on setting up MFA for and using those as ways to learn how to use it up multiple. Um, that's kind of how I learned the YubiKey issue. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get that to work. Um, so it's been interesting. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So setting up multiple methods. Um, once you've set up your first method, obviously it doesn't prompt you or really give you options again. So you actually have to go into your settings as a user. So this is not um, 
the, just the admin settings, this is that any user can go to their settings and under advanced user details, then they have to scroll down until they see where in the regular detail user record, they can see the different connections um, and it gives you that connect disconnect button. So technically a user can reset their MFA themselves if they need to, hopefully they don't. Um, and I believe they're, I'm hoping at some point there's some ability to control that. Um, but from here, I'm able to then click the connect. So if I started off with Salesforce Authenticator is my first one, I can go to where that um, one-time password authenticator is, click that connect. And in the process of doing that, it's going to ask me to authenticate first using Salesforce Authenticator. Then it'll let me register my second device. And then when I log in in the morning, um, usually it prompts for Salesforce Authenticator first, but if you don't um, have that device handy or that tool isn't working, you can choose other options and it will then pop those up and you can use your TOTP. Um, if you're adding security key, it's very similar, except that the link says register. Um, like I said, I haven't been successful to get it to work yet because of the issues with the browser. All right. Um, in the vein of uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, we're going to talk about lining login. When, when I was uh, reading about this in, in one of the resources, it said it's the best feature you've never heard of. And I'm not sure. I think I might have, but I'm, I'm not <laughs> really sure. But it, it's, it's a nifty feature. Um, it, it allows you to have passwordless uh, access to your org. So if you go to setup and then session settings, uh, go to the lining login session and to enable it. And if you want, you can um, also check the, the other checkbox to only allow this for certain uh, users that have that permission enabled either in their profile or you can create a permission set with it. Um, can, can you go to the next slide, Linda, please? Um, so once you do that, uh, very similar to how they uh, enroll in um, in MFA or the TOTP um, the devices, you go to your pro, uh, your own user settings, advanced user details, and towards the bottom is the lining lo login section where, where you can enroll. So so you click that. And it's gonna be very similar. It's gonna either uh, send you an email or or a text message, depending on what you have registered, and you're, you're gonna um, enter that to identify your, yourself. Can go to the next slide. Um, and in your Salesforce Authenticator app, it's gonna uh, generate a, a two-word phrase, and you're gonna enter that from your phone into your your desktop, and that's going to be basically it for you to be enrolling Lightning login. And we can go next. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that was the last. Um, we get to that. So when yeah. you do that, then you can actually use the app to log in to Salesforce rather than having to uh, type in your username and password all the time. Um, yeah. And um, I think we have a little time. Uh, I, I can show that. that that'd be Kind of interesting. If you want to take over sharing. All right, so here I am in my org. And as you can see, uh, next to my, my user, there's a little uh, lining icon. So go there and instead of requiring you or asking you for your, your credentials, it sends a push not notification for my um, Salesforce Authenticator app and I hit approve on the phone. And since I have the uh, MFA uh, permission set, it asked me to, it, in my phone, it, it reads your, your fingerprint. So I do that. If your phone doesn't support that, you you can enter a pen. So it's you're using two two methods, so so to speak, to to authenticate. And 
voila, you're you're in. No no passwords to to remember. I I, I thought that was really cool. I, I showed that to a couple of users that I set up with MFA, and they they were like they they were were really excited. So that's basically it. I. I'm bummed that I cannot show the, the phone part, but a uh, Salesforce Authenticator doesn't allow you to screencast that. It, it's like, I guess, it, since it deals with security. So, but yeah, uh, tr try it out. It's pretty cool. So that that was it for, for, for Lightning login. I will go back to our slides. So you kind of saw a really quick preview of the next slide. So uh, we created a quick little quiz. So it's a Google form that takes you uh, through the quiz. And at the end, if you want to get swag, you can fill in the information um, to submit your name and address. Please make sure your address is complete if you want me to send you swag um, and then submit it. It should save it. You do not have to log into Google to use the form. Um, would have been helpful if I had tested it today. Well, thanks, Orlando, for putting it in the chat. So it's kind of a fun little quiz. Um, we're going to let people take a little bit of time to do it, but you can do it anytime. I'll leave it open for a couple days. Any prizes for intentionally getting wrong answers? So not specifically for getting wrong answers, but if you sign up for swag, I'll still send you swag. I have stickers, I have some magnets, I have small things that I can easily mail. Um, if you're local to Cleveland, who knows, maybe I might drop something bigger off. I feel like my swag closet is way too full because of the fact that we've been virtual. Actually, while we have that going, if anyone has questions that they want to put in the chat or if they want to unmute and ask them, we're more than open for that. All right, Roger, I saw you had a comment in the chat, but uh, I, I didn't quite get it. I, I, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Do you have another? My, my comment about the multitude of options. Yeah. Yeah, so I think just from a... You know, and I, I'm solely coming from a customer side, right? So I've never been on the consulting end of things. Um, and uh, I think from my perspective, I think the confusing thing, and this maybe was more of a general comment around, you know, getting access to systems and, you know, overall, and not just maybe necessarily the Salesforce thing, but it, there is, um, I think the confusing thing for a lot of people, if, we, if you take like the, the individual kind of um, consumer perspective is that there's a lot, there's so many different ways that I can get into something now, right? And it's not like there's, it used to be, oh, you need a username and a password and it was easy, but it was also easy to, to um, uh, not, not uh, you know, like crack or, uh, you know, just, just, just um, brute force get in. Like if you knew something significant about somebody, you could get in. But now there's like so many different ways to get into an application or a system that it becomes almost um, too difficult for, for some people, right? I mean, I, like I'm going through this right now where we've got people in our organization who are like, I don't have a company cell phone and I'm not going to get a company cell phone to do this. You know, so it's, it's kind of interesting um, just because it's a, it's a change in the social as well as the technical. So just more of a more of a comment on that. Just not really me necessarily adding uh, anything in terms of advice or anything like that. Just that's what I've experienced. It's just it's a, there's been a, a bit of a um, you know a bit of a cultural push to say look this this stuff is just getting way too complicated now. Yeah, to uh, back back you on that. That was the type of uh, backlash I would get when 
I was going through this as well. They would say like, we don't want to put this on our phone. We don't want that app on our phone. Um, they know company phones. So, you know, you can't use a company phone. It was just a mess like that. But I think uh, once you kind of explain it to people um, in a way they understand, uh, it, it, people, they, they kind of succumb to it. Um, they end up adopting it. And it gets easier, you know. I think it's just really just the understanding and getting that communication across to your users in a way they understand. Completely agree with that, Amanda. And I think having the options, I mean, I realized that the built-in authenticators for computers, that's still in beta. And I will say it's kind of wonky at best, yeah. Um, but as those get further developed and there are more tools out there that we can use and make available to our users, it's going to become a little simpler. Um, and I think at some point they're going to have to come up with some kind of protocol that's, that's easier <laughs> in the long run. I don't know what that is yet, but, you know, we're all constantly innovating. So hopefully sooner rather than later, there's an easy login method for these things. Um, you know, I, I miss the days when my laptop read my fingerprint. Those were always kind of fun. Um, it was also kind of fun to see if it was going to work on any given day, because things like, you know, just, you know, swelling would affect it. Oh, wow. So, but there's definitely promising new things out there. <laughs> dry winter hands, Rogers says. <laughs> yeah, not dry winter hands, you know, female bloat. We're just going to call it that <laughs> sometime. I don't know. Yeah, I, I get getting overwhelmed by, by multitude of options to do the, the, the same thing, but I guess it's just the nature of of technology and, and, and how things are. <laughs> yeah, so Gabby had a question about recommendations, how to roll out to users. Um, Gabby, with any rollout, communication is the biggest um, key. So keeping them informed, letting them know early enough and often. Um, like I said, we're I'm in the midst of rolling out a, a newer SSO to handle the MSA. And I've been um, emailing users. I started emailing them months ago, letting them know it was coming, um, even though I didn't have infrastructure support to pick a date yet. Um, <laughs> so that made it a little tougher. But you know, a week before we did the install, we and we did the install for the our new um, SSO and MFA solutions and kind of in the background. So it wasn't turned on right away, but I let them know, hey, uh, we've installed this today. This is the date we're turning it on. So easing into it helps as well. So doing smaller groups or um, doing it um, with plenty of warning, but with options. So my users can still log in today with their username and password that um, does not have MFA tied to it yet, but the SSO does. Um, but I'm monitoring constantly. Are they using the, you know, are they logging in from login.salesforce.com? Are they logging in from the My Domain page? And when they're logging in from login.com, I'm sending them friendly email reminders with tips as like, how can you update your bookmarks or please, you know, or how to add a bookmark in case they don't do it. Wow. Uh, Roger, uh, that, that's a great idea uh, to send uh, an email with tips and tricks, like kind of like uh, mask it or like not, not, not going directly to, to MFA and, and have them all scared, but uh, oh yeah, this is a suggestion. And Gabby, that's awesome that you do it weekly. It's a great idea. I, I'm, I should, should try to, to do that as well. Um, in my previous, well, two jobs back, I worked in a huge, huge multinational company. We had like 6,000 users and communication was done months in advance, little by little, the user base was big and, and also a lot of our users were um, uh, a little older in age and they, they were, were uh, they, they needed a lot of help to, to get there. Now I work in a small org, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't communicate uh, constantly and often. That 
I was going to go to that, Roger. Uh, yeah, the in-app guidance, I, I think I have never used it other than to pass uh, trailhead badges. I think it's a, it's a great um, uh, opportunity to use it and, and guide, guide the users. That and updating, um, so you can control a little more on your help menu as well. So you can add your own um, links to the help menu. So if you have files stored, you can create links to those as well which has been um, nice. We've done that. We've also added on our, on the homepage that the users go to, we added a rich text component with additional information and I keep announcements there as well. So lots of different methods to communicate, um, lots of different methods to get user feedback. The other thing I've done is made sure that um, myself or one of the other admins is available so that as users need help, um, they can reach out to us and we make sure we get to them as quickly as we're able to, even though we have lately a full complement of meetings every day <laughs> on various topics. This, this is great. I love all the suggestions. <laughs> great ideas. Thank you for sharing. Um, I just got one quick thing to add, if I could add it. Um, I know it's kind of late, but um, if you're thinking about SSO, there is a little bit more uh, like information you might want to dig up on if you're thinking take that route that wasn't covered in the slides, like making sure the federation ID was in there, um, making sure you turn off the login to the login form if that's how you want to set it up. Um, but yeah, it's we we did it with our company. We're almost finished with the full flown MFA and. Uh, it, the, with the SSO, it really makes things a lot easier. It does, and you have to coordinate often with other teams too. So remember, you may have to reach out to whoever does network administration or your the tool administration you're doing, using the SSO from and coordinate with them. Um, I know for us, we have to, I have to reach out to them whenever there's new users. So we make sure that new user gets added to the group so that they'll be able to do the SSO. Um, but it, you know, it's not that bad, um, in making sure, you know, there it does involve a little more planning and as always, you should test it beforehand. Um, obviously not in production. <laughs> I'm not giving away answers to the quiz. So, um, <laughs> so moving on with our topic. So upcoming announcements. So um, if you're job seeking or hiring, please let us know. Um, we can always post it to our Trailblazer community group um, and help you get word out. Um, you know, and if you post it in LinkedIn or um, in uh, Twitter, we can also help increase visibility. Um, if you haven't heard about it already, there's 100 days of trailhead competition going on. You can join anytime. You don't have to have started on the first. Um, it's available 100 days of trailhead.com. The two leaders of the WIT devs group, uh, Jessica and Rachel, run it every year. It's kind of a lot of fun. You'll see lots of Twitter posts about it, about people who are participating. Um, it, and the focus this year is on learning. So it's, you know, doing trailhead badges, however you're learning, studying research, reading, whatever. Um, it's kind of a fun little competition. Okay, Mike, I see that and I'll make sure you get them. And then um, we're also restarting our sales local Salesforce Saturday next week. I will be at the Panera Bread at Great Northern. So um, that's already posted to our collaboration group on Trailhead. It's Cleveland Salesforce Saturday. Our developer group also has um, a Trailblazer community group. You're welcome to join. We try to keep the developer one local. The Cleveland one for Salesforce Saturday is a little more open. But um, those who are not local to the area are welcome to join our events anytime. And hopefully we'll uh, have you join us again in the future. So that's my last slide. This is my thank you slide. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part of our community. We're very happy to have you here. And thanks to those who've asked questions and shared. Um, always great. And I know there's some more questions, but I'm gonna turn off the recording now. Um, the recording will be made available 
questions, I find opponents to stop it. Um, 